Hey, it's primary day here in Pennsylvania. It is Tuesday, April 25th, 2016. I am Kevin Mahoney. I am the editor and founder of Raging Chicken Press, and welcome to Raging Chicken Radio's Out to Coop podcast. Each week, we check in with our capital correspondent, Sean Kitchen, on the good, the bad, and the ugly that is Harrisburg, PA. And we're now on iTunes and Stitcher and SoundCloud. So subscribe to the podcast and give us some feedback. That really helps us get up there on the ratings and get noticed and expand our reach. So help us out. Raging Chicken Radio is a project of Raging Chicken Press. Check us out and check us out here, obviously, and at RagingChickenPress.org for all the citizen journalism we do there. If you like what you see, click on the support and membership tab and become a member for as little as $5 a month. And if you're interested in contributing to Raging Chicken Press, just drop us an email at ragingchickenpress at gmail.com or send us a direct message on Twitter. On Twitter. We're at RC Press on Twitter. We began Raging Chicken Press almost five years ago um, to provide a platform for homegrown progressive citizen journalism and media activism. So if you've got something to say or if you just want to learn how to do this work, drop us an email at ragingchickenpress at gmail.com and let's get started. So it's a uh, primary day here in Pennsylvania. Like I said, uh, we're actually uh, recording this on Mondays. So we're recording this a little bit ahead because uh, Sean and my, our schedules are just crazy right now. And I'm going to be without a home computer for a couple days here too. So we're going to do a little pre-recording. Maybe we'll do an update tomorrow if uh, anything kind of breaks um, when we get late, um, anything breaks throughout the day. So um for now, we're just going to kind of dig in. It's been a crazy week in Pennsylvania as the campaign, presidential campaign, went in full force uh, throughout our state. But we also got Senate races going on here. Um, so to get the latest for this, uh, we're going to turn right now to Sean Kitchen. Sean, how you doing, man? Oh, man, I am tired. <laughs> You're tired. I am, I am tired. <laughs> You're sick and tired or just tired? I'm just tired. <laughs> oh, it's been quite a week for you. I mean, you've been you've been all over the place, a variety of different events and so on. Yes. Uh, on Thursday, I was able to go to a uh, President Clinton event in um, in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. He was speaking at the uh, Keystone office building uh, mm -hmm. right off of 4th and Forster. And then the very next day in fr on Friday, I was down in Gettysburg uh, listening to Senator Bernie Sanders speak to a crowd of veterans in a town hall. Um, on Gettysburg you know, College's campus. Oh, pretty incredible. I mean, what what was I mean? What were the events like? I mean, were they pretty crazy? Um, the Clinton event was more subdued. Maybe only had like a few hundred people in there. Mm -hmm. They bust in school children for the event, um, and then the Bernie Sanders event. Uh, you had like two thousand people inside the auditorium, and then there was five hundred more people in an overflow room listening to Senator Sanders speak. Wow. So they 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 were very different. One was obviously they were both obviously staged, but the um the Bill Clinton event felt more like more of a performance than the town hall with uh, Senator Sanders. I see what you're saying. So uh, at those events, um, I mean, we obviously know pretty much now we've got to talk to the, you know, the contours of these campaigns. Uh, we know the kind of the general kind of broad brushes. Was there anything that really stood out at any of these events um, that would be kind of relevant as voters get ready to go to the polls? Um, yeah. Uh, on Thursday, President Clinton was talking about the recovery and the job Obama has done in the past eight years and how he should be given credit for bringing this country back from one of the biggest economic hardships. Uh, we have ever faced, you know, outside of the Great Depression. And then, um, as he said, he blamed young people, millennials, for not voting in 2010 and actually impeding pr the president's progress. He said if young voters, the disillusioned young voters, would have voted, we would have had all of our income back since the, uh, since the Great Recession. And he's really pinning, he called, he called uh, millennials disillusioned young voters who didn't vote in 2010 and implying they're only getting involved in this for uh, political reasons in 2016. That's pretty incredible. I mean, and this has been a mark of the kind of new Democrats, I mean, for a, a long time now. And you and I were talking a few days back. I've been reading this book by Thomas Frank called Listen Liberal. And I have to say that uh, Frank goes through uh, some of the history of the New Democrats, in particular, the 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 quote unquote journey of Bill Clinton, and that's how the narrative was cast, at least. And one of the things that the Clinton administration did, uh, he did this during his campaign, but he also did this um, during his presidency, was this thing called counter scheduling. And the idea there was that you'd attack 
a policy of the Republicans or something on the right. And then in your next step, you counter schedule that you by attacking the progressives in your own party, particularly labor, um, whether you're talking about feminists, you know, the, the famous sister soul job moment from back in the day. Um, and the idea was that you go after your own base as a way of telling the rest of the America that, look, you're not beholden to these people and that you could still count on those people because they had no place else to go. So they saw it as this kind of win-win brilliant strategy. But that is exactly the, the kind of strategy that has driven so many young voters away. Um, and this, a lot of folks that were, used to be the base of the Democratic Party away. So to hear him echo that kind of approach to politics um, is pretty disturbing, especially as we sit here on the precipice of, of, of hopefully pushing that Democratic Party in a very much more progressive, uh, progressive direction. Mm -hmm. And another thing that happened at the um, Clinton campaign was that, or the Clinton event, President Clinton um, went after Senator Sanders' uh, free public higher education um, platform, mm -hmm. basically saying that it would be practically impossible to have that happen in Pennsylvania because uh, two-thirds of the federal government would pick up the cost and you would need state legislators to pick up um, one-third of that cost. And he's cite like the Obamacare fight and the Medicaid expansion as reasons why they won't do that. And also because of the gridlock of our um, our budget um, situation. And <clears throat> I mean, yeah, Clinton came in with um, knowledge, you know, the state knowledge of what's going on in the budget fight between Republicans and Governor Wolf. Mm -hmm. But one thing I found fascinating was that he wants to fix the things or uh, Hillary wants to fix the things that she voted on and that Bill did for students as they were president. Um, you know, making it easier to re maybe refinance your student loans or get out of student financial debt, which is uh, two things that the Clinton supported. Hillary Clinton voted for the bankruptcy bill in 2005. Mm -hmm. And then Bill Clinton laid the groundwork in the mid 90s That's right. where you can't uh, bankrupt or default on your student loans. So I found that like they're coming and finally coming around to that. But one of the things is that they would also need state legislatures to approve that, which was. Well, you know, there's there's two things with that. I mean, I don't know if you remember this, but the, uh, a couple of years back at the PA Progressive Summit, um, we sat at this. Um, it, it was a session on student loan debt. And there was this guy from Wisconsin who was part of a Wisconsin nonprofit that was kind of laying out um, the history of why we are or how we got to where we are now. And it was like, again, 1992, 1993, 1994 is when the major reforms in student loans took place. And by reforms, I really should be saying deforms, because that's when you had all this kind of deregulation and privatization and profitization on student loans. Um, and that's what we also saw the beginning of the escalation of education costs. So, I mean, it just echoes exactly what you're saying. I mean, this is... Um, you know, the, the Bill Clinton's administration, and again, he doesn't bear all the responsibility for it. I mean, obviously the um, the people in the, the Senate and the House uh, were right there along with it, but th those 90s, those years of quote unquote prosperity they keep on touting, um, were also those very years that uh, are, are kind of coming back to bite us right now. Yeah, and then, um, yeah, I, I would definitely agree with that. And then moving on to the uh, next event, you know, the next day I went, went to a Sanders event without kind of reading, doing the uh, pre-reading on what's been, what it was about. And here it turned out to be a, um, turned out to be a town hall on veterans affairs and military issues. Mm -hmm. And one of the interesting things coming out of that, well, first of all, Tulsi, uh, Tulsa Gaffords, mm -hmm. She introduced Senator Sanders, which I thought was amazing. She was, what, number two at the DNC, and she came out in support. Right, and right. Then, and then um, she actually resigned from that post because of the DNC's uh, going after Senator Sanders and making it a fixed race in her view. And then um, it was interesting hearing Senator Sanders speak on how he actually got things done in while he was on the House Republican or the House Foreign or the House uh, Veteran Affairs Committee, mm -hmm. you know, as a minority chairman. Um, right, and the, right. the things he did, you know, he said, like, listen, I didn't put any legislation forward, but what I did was I worked with the Republicans in the committee process to amend these bills and make these bills stronger, which is, I think, something that you really don't hear about, like, you know, the behind the scenes stuff that happens in uh, either in Congress or in, say, the General Assembly in Pennsylvania. No, and I think, you know, and unfortunately, it's um, it's this is just kind of the nature of, I think, the presidential campaigns is because, you know, Bernie Sanders campaign also made a decision to 
kind of not get into that stuff as much throughout the campaign because his actual behind the scenes knowledge of uh, you know the legislative process of what he's done um, shows somebody who has been very effective um, at getting kind of major kind of legislation passed, um, even w working with Republicans to kind of push things in, in, in more progressive directions. But, you know, I, I mean, I get it. I mean, his campaign is really focused on his message and he's incredibly disciplined in terms of the message. But it was interesting to see kind of coming out of that town hall, some of those um, those those things, you know, finally being discussed. So I'm looking at the polls right now and it looks like, you know, in uh, Pennsylvania, this is from Real Clear Politics. The Pennsylvania's Democratic presidential primary, um, you know, they have the their average is still showing that Clinton is up by about 14 points. Although I have to say, there was just uh, the a CBS News uh, YouGov poll that came out that showed Clinton's lead only um, eight points. So there seems to be some tightening of the race where uh, Sanders is is involved. And at the Republican side, you've got Donald Trump really just kind of looks like he's going to run away with it. I mean, he's like he's up by 20 points basically um, for Real Clear Politics too as well. Um, um, and when we get down to the PA primary or the PA Democratic primary for the a PA Senate, um, you know, Sestak is still holding on to a, a small lead. I mean, right now we're looking at about a six point lead, 6.3 lead, according to Real Clear Politics. Um, it looks like Katie McGinty has begun to um, kind of, you know, uh, grab a little closer. Uh, John Fetterman, who's, you know, I mean, the progressive candidate, as far as I'm concerned in Pennsylvania right now, um, John Fetterman is, uh, you know, still polling uh, in single digits, but, you know, he's been slowly climbing. So we'll see what happens. Yeah. And I'm, I'm actually, um, you know, I've been tossing around who I'm going to be supporting in this race, uh, the primary, you know, and I really just started thinking, you know, actually, Fetterman's my guy. I mean, you're not voting for the establishment candidate. You're not going to be voting for the winner, but you're voting for the, the, the future of the party in this state. And it's going to be really interesting because I honestly believe that his ideals and his um, his policy positions is the future of the Democratic Party. And either the and these leaders are going to get toppled pretty soon if they don't start adapting to what the needs of younger people and the needs of your rural impoverished um, residents. Oh, absolutely. So I'll tell you what, it's a, this is a good place to leave it right now for the before the break. When we come back, one thing I want to talk a little bit about is kind of where we go from here, um, particularly for the Bernie Sanders campaign. And then I also want to, you know, get in, you know, Sean, you know, if you're willing to talk a little about what that experience was like, just being able to go to these events um, and being able to kind of uh, see what's going on and the kind of discussions you had with the journalists. I mean, you and I've talked a little bit about this, um, but it'd be great to kind of share with um, other folks out there. So when we come back, uh, we'll pick it up with Sean Kitchen. This is Kevin Mahoney. I'm the editor and founder of Raging Chicken Press. Uh, we'll be back right after this. Welcome back. This is Raging Chicken Radio's Out to Coop podcast. I'm here with Sean Kitchen, our capital correspondent and assistant editor out there in Harrisburg, PA. And today is Pennsylvania primary day. Well, it's actually tomorrow because we're pre-recording this, but... For all practical purposes, it is Pennsylvania Primary Day, and we're finally right up to it. You know, it's not every day that Pennsylvanians actually get to have a choice that matters in the Pennsylvania primaries. I mean, usually, this is all put away by there. Um, what's your sense of the race this year, Sean? I mean, this is this is a, I mean, a really spectacular kind of um, uh, progressive showing all across the board. Yeah, I think um, you know, I think Sanders Sanders is doing it right. Ob I mean, obviously, we're getting to that point where. It's becoming impossible for him for type the nomination, but I think he should still continue and start continue pushing Clinton more to the left and more getting, you know, I think he's movement building now, which is something that's really nice to see in uh, the 2016 election because 2004, the 2004 election, it seemed like Howard Dean had that opportunity and he uh, wilts it like a flower. Yeah, I'll say. <laughs> well, well, you know, and this it raises the, the, big, the big issue about, you know, is... Sanders is Bernie Sanders, but also, you know, is his campaign willing to make that shift um, to, you know, about to make this explicitly explicitly about movement building now? Because, it, you know, you know, I'm I look, I'm going to vote for Bernie Sanders. Um, and uh, but I fully expect that he's not going to get the nomination at this point. And that's kind of where I'm at. It's not, look, it's not out of, um, it's not impossible, but it, it's increasingly unlikely. Um, and as, as much of a realist as I am, I get to the point where I'm like, okay, 
you know, we got to kind of accept this, but how to move there. And my concern is that, um, you know, you got the birdie bros and all this kind of garbage, all these people that, you know, they still say, well, if it's birdie or bust, and then that's it, we're done. I'm not going to vote for anybody. But that then, in my mind, it, it's, it completely negates what the message about a political revolution has been about. I mean, the nuts and bolts of organizing are not about electing a messiah. They're about actually doing the gritty work of organizing. And, yeah. And, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. I, don't know, I was going to say, you know, five years ago, I was sleeping on some sidewalk in Philadelphia, you know, with the Occupy movement. And we're seeing, we're still seeing that play out today. And I think this is where, I think bro, this is only a stepping stone towards the next, later on down the line. I don't think it's going to be like 2008 where everyone goes away because you have these committed activists who are involved with the camp, the Bernie Sanders campaign. And how much you have all these uh, movements actually making gains of like 415, uh, paid sick leave movements, and like all this other stuff happening around the country, where I think it only furthers that down the line. I think you're actually energizing more people to get involved. And I think we could actually make more substantial gains, you know, in the next, next couple of years. Maybe not legislatively or electing people to office, but policy wise, I think you can. No, I think I think both of those things. I mean, I agree with you 100%, and I think it's a great way of putting it that those activists are out there. And frankly, you know, you had that article that that you said for for Bloomsburg News like last week that you know basically say there's these you know um, folks that come out of the Occupy movement and those seasoned activists who are basically saying it's like, look, Bernie is kind of one of us. Like we don't depend upon Bernie, right? He's running for this, and he's he's reflecting some of the values that we've been pushing for a while. Um, so the question is, is the campaign? going to kind of shift towards supporting those activists, right? And then trying to bring those other, you know, young folks in particular who are energized for, about politics for the first time, are they going to bring them along? And I, so I've been thinking a lot about, well, how do you actually do that? So if you bear with me for a second, I'm going to give you my, here, here's my, uh, these, these three points at this point, this is my unsolicited advice for the Bernie Sanders campaign, right? Is that if you actually want to make that pivot towards, building that movement, right? Supporting that political revolution and putting some even more wind in the sails of the activists who are going to be, you know, are still going to be there um, after the primary, after the presidential election. I was thinking about how do you do this, right? Because you look at the campaign has raised so much money. They've got so much support. The organizing has been amazing. But what do you do with that? Right. Um, and I don't like the idea is that you just keep on pretending that you can win right? Um, that doesn't seem to be the best strategy because people are going to start saying, look, he's not being honest with us. This this campaign is, you know, they're not dealing with reality and that's going to hurt progressives. So I was thinking about these three things. Like, imagine this. Imagine if you say, okay, you start pivoting. You don't stop campaigning. You keep going, but you say, for example, you go after, you go and campaign directly in those states that um, you have um, seats that are up that it looks like progressives um, in those states could win. And I know his candidate, for example, or he, he has already endorsed like Zephyr Teachout of New York, uh, Pramila uh, Jay Jayapal, I, I always I was messed up her name, sorry. Uh, Pramila Jayapal, Jayapal of Washington State and Lucy Flores of Nevada. Imagine if you've got the campaign around up, you got to go support those, um, support those, um, those campaigns to try to get them into the Senate because we've got to shift that over. That, as, secondly, look at all the voting issues that have happened. Right, you got lawsuits in Arizona, you got lawsuits in New York. Why not? bring that campaign to those states that have experienced serious voting problems and get, put the national spotlight right on those states to get those campaign issues, to get those election issues kind of sorted out. And then finally, you know, imagine if he keeps on going around to all the sites that have experienced, have been devastated by these 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 horrible trade deals, right? By NAFTA, by CAFTA, by, you know, right now we're trying to get the TPP passed. You got going and using that as your backdrop to talk about the impact on, on communities. That could be incredibly energizing to activists who've been there all along the way. And at the same time, keep the pressure on the Democrats, on Hillary Clinton, that these issues have to be front and center. And that, you know, that's kind of what I think would be, you know, that would be kind of a great step forward, that kind of move. I don't know what you think of that. No, I think it's really good. <laughs> that's I'm, my. I'm, I'm a complete, complete agreement. <laughs> yeah, that's a, it's my little kind of unsolicited advice for the campaign. So you know, I, I get worried about people getting uh, getting turned off from the political process. And I go back to what Sam Cedar said in the Majority Report a couple of weeks ago. He's like, you know, voting is not about just your personal, individual self-expression. 
right? Uh, yes, that's part of it. But voting is tactical and political. And if you care about building political movements, right, you've got to deal with what we've got and constantly push forward. So anyways, that's the end of my little preaching for this. But, you know, the, the other thing I was thinking about, Sean, is that, you know, that also means, you know, the kind of the work that we're doing here at Raging Chicken Press and the kind of, you know, work that we've been trying to do and continue to try to plug away at is that it's all the more important as part of that movement to build this kind of citizen media. And, you know, this is the first real presidential campaign that you've actually had access to some of these sites. I mean, I think it's pretty incredible. So, I mean, what's what was that whole process like and what was the kind of conversations you got involved to and to walk us through that? It was an amazing feeling. Um, you know, five years ago, four years ago, I was at the Mitt Romney event um, where he ended up like fleeing, you know, as a as a blogger, as like a bystander, you know, not official press person. So that was like a really interesting event. Um, did some things in Philadelphia, but this the last week where the first time I actually got media access to, um, you know, being up on the the podiums, you know, with my camera and stuff, taking photos and taking videos of, you know, Bill Clinton and Senator Sanders uh, speaking at these events. It was at, it was really interesting. Uh, you had to show up like four hours in advance to get your credentials and check in. You really can't leave the area. You know, you got to stay there the whole time. You know, if you're in Gettysburg, you're not going anywhere. You know, it, it was just a really interesting time. Um, you know, and at the Sanders event especially, I had a couple conversations with people uh, that were kind of interesting. Um, one was with this Washington Post reporter, maybe in his 50s, you know, middle-aged man. He's wearing a little fedora hat. Uh Pet, like you know, heavy set, you know, just all this grizzled uh, veteran reporter, and we were talking about. I was like, "Oh, so you're you're with the Post?" And he's like, "Yeah." I was like, "So are you freelancing for them?" And he kind of looked at me. And he's like, "No, I'm actually a reporter with them." But he's probably like, "I'll be the last reporter they'll ever hire." You know, really? most of it's going to be part time temp workers, mm -hmm. bringing us our journalism at one of the most established media outlets in the country. That's <clears throat> incredible. That's yeah, incredible. and then. And then five minutes later, I was talking to another journalist, younger guy, maybe in his early 30s. Um, he, he had like that whole entire like New York, D.C. hipster thing going on, that look going on. So we're talking, and he had here he had a German accent. Mm -hmm. And um, I asked him, so I was like, oh, so what paper are you with? And I, I can't pronounce the name of the newspaper, but it was the paper that just published um, the Panama Papers. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, his news org, and I was just like, take a moment to think about that. His news organization, you know, across, the, you know, pretty much across the, the world, you know, the other half of the world, is investing in their media and they're actually having people go out in the States following these campaigns. Like he followed the whole entire Sanders campaign. He was able to follow the Obama campaign, the Romney campaigns back in 2012. But I was thinking about that, like the investment, like you have these two different you have these two different reporters coming from different angles yep you know one's very cynical in the future of the media in this country and the other one comes from an organization that actually invests in media you know from over in Europe and you could tell by he was this young actually enjoyed he had the, you could tell he had the passion and the drive that he was doing yeah and we, we were talking about like some of the stuff we're doing and what it's like talking covering politics in Pennsylvania you know, this is still a passion. And he, even though it was a, it's still a passion, it's not paying that much. Um, he could tell, he thought it was like really awesome, the stuff that like explained that we're doing out here. You know, well, and, the, and it's like that need for the media because it's like you don't have that on the local level anymore. No, I mean, I think I, you're absolutely right. I mean, you know, this is, uh, you know, what we've been saying for a long time now. You know, for those of you who are, who are not as familiar with Raging Chicken Press who are out there listening to this, is like, you know, look, we, you know, we have a small uh, membership base. We do a little bit of advertising and so on. We get some donations once in a while. Uh, but basically, this is a completely volunteer operation at this point. I mean, uh, we've raised some money to basically get, uh, um, get some tech supplies for Sean to get him set up out there in Harrisburg. Uh, but I don't get it paid from Raging Chicken Press. Sean doesn't get paid from Raging chicken press this is something that is right now it's about passion um but you know just like voting is not about your personal expression um when it comes to serious journalism um to doing the kind of work that we're trying to do um passion is not enough i mean you got to eat you got to live um and looking for that uh, kind of new model um, for investigative cutting journalism that's really going to hold powers, you know, hold power accountable is what we're trying to do, you know, and, and, you know, 
and this is why I say, look, you know, if you can, you know, if you're out there, um, become a member of Raging Chicken Press, right? Or, you know, pick another alternative media form. I'd prefer you pick us because we can only expand what we're doing. And for a little bit of seriously, you think about it, like the cost of a beer a month, right? Or a kind of good cup of coffee a month, five bucks a month, you become a member of Raging Chicken Press and really help support what we're doing. I mean, ideally where we want to be is we want to be in a place where, you know, Sean doesn't have to, uh, you know, uh, take off from work or try to kind of get someone to cover for him and um, spend his day and actually, or lose out of day's pay, right, in order to cover these events. Uh, you just heard him say, you got to go and set up like, you know, three, four hours ahead of time. It takes a whole day. And that's, you know, uh, we should be supporting people doing that. So look, if you can, again, ragingchickenpress.org, you go to our website, click on the support membership tab, um, become a member, throw us a donation, um, do whatever you can. And, you know, and also, uh, we do have a little thing out there too, as well. For you know, as, as much as as have problems with Amazon and other if you do buy crap through Amazon, you know, you can go to our website and buy it through that link, and we get a, like a six percent kickback from there. Little things that we can do, but you know, that's all part of our search for making this uh, progressive activist media here in Pennsylvania uh, a sustainable endeavor. And you know, is is fantastic that you got a chance to talk to some of these folks. You, you know, just to kind of reaffirm, like we're really at a kind of crossroads when it comes to um, the practice of journalism. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, hey, I can't say it any better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going on and on today. This is what happens this, when- uh, This when is an you, NPR over here. <laughs> I, I don't know what this is. Uh, this is- uh, you know, this is what but, happens when you've got a whole lot of stuff in, in life going on and, you know, we have to but, rearrange uh, our schedules things, to get this podcast going and everything like that. Is what, one of the things I want to say about the Sanders campaign, event, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it was a town hall on uh, veterans issues, but the press area was absolutely, was pretty it, different. You know, you had this main podium set up with like 20, 30 tripods on there from all the national media outlets. Uh -huh. Then behind it, you had two rows of like working stations for journalists and writers so as mm -hmm. he's speaking all the like the writers are back there on their keyboards just going away at it you know getting their stories written up right right and the thing is it's like um you're in this auditorium and so you're like in this this penned off area you know you can't leave the press area but the one thing is so we get like a big like rectangle in the back of the auditorium right in the middle of the back end towards the back of it and then that on the one side i had like this little sliver like an arm extending out, mm -hmm. where it got you within ten feet of the stage. Oh man, Sanders. that's awesome! And you're able to get like really close up videos and shots of him and stuff like that. Oh, that explains. I mean, if you go to our Facebook page, uh, the Raging Chicken Press uh, Facebook page, Sean has posted up some of those images there, uh, and so that's how you got those. I mean, I, I was wondering, you know, how how you got such great image. It wasn't like you had a telephoto lens. You were able to almost walk up right to the stage. I was like literally fifteen feet away from the stage, uh, the way they had it set up. Um, which is really fun. Um, yeah, and I guess we can talk about more of this later. You know, the place I work at, I had a couple people come up to me. He's like, hey, we're, we're, what were you doing at the Bill Clinton event? Like, what do you mean? He's like, you know, I, I see you every, pretty much like, you know, a couple times a week in here. And uh, he's like, I, I saw you standing up on top of that podium with, with your <laughs> camera and everything. He's like, what were you doing up there? He's like, you have access to that? I'm like, yeah. And, you know, having this like little back and forth and the stuff we're doing. And the guys like, actually some of the customers think that's pretty amazing. Like, uh, yeah, well, you know, I, it is Sean. I mean, it is, you know, I mean, it's a testament to the kind of work that you've been doing. It's a testament to, um, I think what we've been able to build and, you know, it's no small thing, you know, and it's, it's, it's something that's huge, but we're, we're going to take a break in a second and, uh, we're going to come back and we're going to talk a little bit about some fun stuff, um, more beer stuff today. Um, and, uh, we'll take it from there. But one of the things that Sean just pointed out is like, you know, getting access to these events and so on. It's like, you know, if you are out there and you are an aspiring citizen journalist, you are someone out there who thinks this would be the coolest thing to do um but you you know you don't have the experience or you're nervous about doing that you know seriously drop us a line raging chicken press at gmail.com um and we can help you get started in this stuff um you know i'm the editor of raging chicken press well i will work with you um and we can get you media access to some of these kind of events um so we can begin covering them from a people's perspective so that's kind of what we're after anyways we're going to take a little break when we come back we'll be back with sean and more raging chicken radios out to coop podcast this is kevin mahoney we'll be right back
Welcome back to Raging Chicken Radio's Out to Coop podcast. This is Kevin Mahoney. I'm the editor and founder of Raging Chicken Press. And every week we talk with Sean Kitchen, our Harrisburg correspondent and assistant editor of Raging Chicken Press out there in Harrisburg. So, Sean, uh, big week out there in Harrisburg this week. It was Harrisburg Beer Week. Uh, what was that like? Well, um, it started off on Friday. Uh, set the Trogues uh, released a new um, 717 beer, mm-hmm. which last year was like a Saison IPA, like a really like really funky beer. Um, this year they released a uh, orange zested IPA, which is absolutely amazing. It was on tap th- Friday night at all the local bars, and um, it's really easy to crush. I had a couple few with a uh, with uh, one of my. Coworkers have to work on Friday night. <laughs> now, did they? I got to ask you about this. I saw that. Re- I saw that release, and it looked so amazing. Was that just for Harrisburg Beer Week? Are they bottling that? Is that going to be available elsewhere? Um, I think. They're, I think they're canning it, and it's only going to be within the seven one seven area code. Oh man! Um, so I got to take a trip, like, is what you're telling me. Yeah, the, and then um, this is the second year for Harrisburg Beer Week. Um, so like this year from last year, like actually it's blowing up. Uh, we had. A, I went to a couple of events over the weekend. Mm-hmm. Um, actually, where I, I work at a local brewery, uh, we had a free will tap takeover, and holy crap, there was not as there was it was standing room only. This place was all the aisles were filled up, and we were just handing out beers left and right to people. Like, oh, that's you know, I, I'm so. Different. I, you know, when you told me that first, I was psyched too because you know, for like free will is right, right in my backyard practically. I mean, I'm kind of walking distance. I could get over there and to see them uh, kind of build that brewery from, um, you know, nothing to the point the, where little, like basement warehouse. Yeah, it was a warehouse good, basement. To- that's what it used to be. Now they they moved upstairs. They got a nice tap room and everything like this. And so it's it's kind of good to see them kind of making it. And you know, it really has been become a, a, a community uh, a community gathering place. I mean, it's been pretty impressive. So, anyways, but the, you know, just psyched that they were out there uh, for the for the tap takeover. Yeah, and then yesterday was a pretty wild day itself. Um, we we really we had a bottle release of a peach apricot sour that's been aging in barrels for six months, mm-hmm. and then the base beer has I think been blended so many times it's at least like three or four years old. Oh man! So that you have a sour beer, it's like three years old, the base of it, and then um, <clears throat> and then the uh, it was soured with a bunch of apricots and peaches. Oh man, was that amazing! We blew through our allotment within twelve hours. Get out of here! So it's totally gone. Nobody's getting any more of this. Uh, no, no more bottles are leaving the premises. If you uh, want to have to, you have to drink it there on site. Impressive. And uh, yeah, it was. It was. I, mean, I got out of my car, I saw the line. I was like, oh man, this is like 15 minutes before opening. There's like 150 people, 110 people in line, and uh, everyone's kind of like yelling my name as I'm walking by. Getting, you're getting like that rock star status. <laughs> like guys, I'm just going to work for the next 12 hours. <laughs> nice. <laughs> So you go from like, uh, you know, 10 feet away from Bernie Sanders at his campaign event to like major bottle of release and being the rock star there. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just like, and I did pick up a couple bottles myself. Uh, good. Well, which, you know. yeah, there goes a the day's pay. <laughs> you got to do that. Well, all right. So, uh, yeah, I guess I'm going to have to take a trip out there and uh, and kind of sample that myself, uh, both for the Trogues release uh, and for... The, was it is that an apricot what saison? It's a peach apricot peach sour. Apricot Pe- sour, sorry. Yes, uh, released by Pizza Boy, and um, their sour game is just killing it right now in uh, Pennsylvania. And what they do is, yeah, it's pretty remarkable. Like it was, it was actually my first bottle release. I worked, opened the clothes, and it was just re- I, I had my jaw dropped. Oh, like man. watching this like line of people coming, you just see that pyramid stack of beers just. Gone. <laughs> That's awesome. Most of it gone within the first two hours, and then the rest just trickled out throughout the rest of the day. That's awesome. Well, I'll tell you what. It does, I'm going to give you a little preview for those folks who uh, who actually made it to all the way to the end of today's podcast. Um, one of the things that we're going to be adding to this, uh, to the out to coop, is we're going to be adding segments uh, for basically like a second half an hour, um, and it'll be a different segment uh, each week. Like right? so, we'll, we'll kind of rotate them so there'll be like four segments or five segments. So. Of that. And one of those is really going to be focused on Pennsylvania's craft beer industry and, you know, probably craft beer a little bit la- la- larger um, in part, you know, I mean, obviously, you know, but if you listen to us so far, you know, that Sean and I both um, kind of love craft beer. Sean is like, you know, whatever, you know, rock star status. I'm just, a, yeah, I'm just a guy who's like, oh, this is good, you know, but um, 
but uh you know but i think what what interests me especially about the craft beer um kind of industry um has been like i was talking about with free will is that these have really be become uh, startups that uh, many of them not all of them but many of them have really kind of gravitated towards this ethic of local of community support of kind of organic food and so on like i'll talk about like last week i think it was it talked about saucony creek where you know they opened their uh gastro pub and um and tap room and they have all this kind of amazing local food and they've really gone out of their way to um you know buy from folks in pennsylvania especially farmers right in the region around kutztown and that's i know i said the same thing about where i'm at pizza boy house of hampton yeah. Um, it's like there's a hundred beers on tap there, and most of those lines are Pennsylvania breweries only. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, our 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 owner has a philosophy of like supporting all the local breweries. It doesn't matter if the beer is like one of the best or you know an okay beer. Mm -hmm. It's on there no matter what because it's supporting the local local brewers around here. It's you know we had free will up here. The place got packed. Uh, yeah. All these different free will sours. Um, all of our ingredients are most of them like for the fruits and everything are sourced by local farmers in the area. And it's the same thing. It's what everyone's doing around here. Free will probably does the same thing. Um, I know that connection between the two is made through those, uh, through the, through the local farms where they get their, where their right. fruit for those beers. Absolutely. And I think that, you know, this, this is the kind of thing where, uh, and I know everybody, yes, I know we're going way long today, but I'm just going to kind of let it go. Um, that this is kind of one of those things where uh, what's what's amazing about what the craft brew industry has has been able to do um, has been to build these kind of cultures around this and become true kind of community gathering places you know because this is the way brewing used to be um, before corporations got in the game and you know started these kind of mass production lines of beer um every little locale used to have its own little uh, brew pub and you could still go some places like in germany and this kind of stuff where that that is true that you can only excuse me get that beer kind of right in that right in that area so you know we hope to do that so you know i also put it you know put a call out to anybody who has ideas uh, about different breweries in your area different brew pubs and you know if it's not from pennsylvania still shoot us a line your raging chicken press at gmail.com uh or, or kind of you know tweet at us at at rc press um about kind of ideas that you might have about some brews you like to highlight because you know, what i'd like to get into in some of the and that segment at least in that podcast is not the kind of beer snobbery stuff about like you know the nose on this one is the particular thing so therefore <laughs> this is good and all the other ones suck it's not about kind of choosing the best and hating on the rest it's more kind of you know uh highlighting particular beers and highlighting this industry um, that really can show us what, you know, what the world could look like if we decided to commit um, to kind of local and to organic and um, to rebuilding our communities. You know, it doesn't have to be an anti-business movement, especially if you have businesses businesses that are committed to their community. So um, once again, there I go on my rant today. I don't know what is in my head, but so anyway, Sean. Uh, it's been great talking this week, and uh, I guess we'll see what happens in the primary, in the PA primary, and we'll kind of uh, do a post-mortem next week and see what else goes on. So It'll be interesting. Yeah. You know, um, yeah. No, All right. And, and it looks like they're not coming back for another couple of weeks in Harrisburg, so we got some uh, time to talk. All right. Well, there you go. All right. This is it. We are out. This is Raging Chicken Radio's Out to Goop Podcast. This is Kevin Mahoney, editor and founder, and that's Sean Kitchen out there in Harrisburg. We will be back with you next week for our next episode. See ya.